Daryl Rogers is a speaker, author, and family recovery coach living in Cary, North Carolina. At the age of 19, Daryl began a career as a corporate pilot. He served as a medic in the Army National Guard and became a co-pilot of the AH-64 Apache helicopter. That's so cool. Daryl and his wife, Kim, have been married for 32 years. They are proud parents of two boys, Justin and Chase. In 2014, the oldest of their two sons, Chase, died in a marijuana-impaired wreck after struggling with addiction for a year and a half. Now, Daryl and his Daryl is a family recovery coach who specializes in working with parents of addicted loved ones, pals. And Daryl also serves on the state advisory board of North Carolina Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Daryl has learned how to turn his pain into purpose. Daryl, thank you for being with us tonight and your willingness to share your experience, strength, and hope. And the floor is all yours. All right. Thanks, Aubrey. It's good to be with everybody here. Um, appreciate you being here. And um, uh, so I'll just start off by telling you a little bit about myself. I'll keep it real brief and I'll get into the story. And, um, you know, I'm, I'll just give you a little warning. The story's kind of rough. You know, it's it's not a great, it's not a fun, pleasant story, but uh, um, it, um, you know, the 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 takeaway at the end of it is that no matter what you're going through, well, there's several takeaways, but but one of the big ones is that no matter what you're going through, that if you can learn how to, I'm living proof that you can learn how to take whatever pain there is that you're experiencing and, and uh, kind of repurpose it, use it to fuel your engine, to fuel your fire, to get you going in a good direction and do some positive things out of it that'll help bring you healing and, and hopefully help a few other people along the way. So, um, you know, we're, uh, I'm from South Carolina originally, grew up in the country, and um, we, um, my wife Kim and I met in the Greenville Spartanburg area of South Carolina in, um, uh, well, night, well, it was, I guess it was about 87, I, I better not say, because I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> my memory is not so good on some things, but uh Anyway, we got we got married in 1990 and moved here to Cary, North Carolina, right outside of Raleigh. And um, as we uh, we raised two boys, Justin and Chase, are seven years apart. Um, uh, Chase is the one who I'll be talking about tonight. Uh, he was the oldest of the two. And um, I'll just start out. And you know, I know not everybody's a football fan, okay, but. <laughs> Uh, there is this starts out with a football story, and uh, this is the way I always tell the story uh, because it tells you a lot about who Chase was as a person. Uh, there's certainly a lot more to him than this one story, uh, uh, quite uh, quite the character, but uh, but this will tell you a lot about him. So it was um, uh, October the fifteenth, twenty eleven. I was attending a high school football game in Virginia. It was a beautiful day for football. Uh, not a cloud in the sky, perfectly manicured field. And uh, the stands were packed full of fans because, uh, you know, the, the home team was celebrating their homecoming. Um, most, this was a high school game, and most high school games I know are played on Friday nights, but this was a Saturday afternoon game. And um, my son Chase was a starting cornerback on the – visiting team. For those of you who may not know much about football, um, the cornerback's job, he's a defensive back. His job primarily is to cover the wide receivers on his side of the field, make sure they don't make a catch, uh, come up on run plays to his side of the field, try to make a tackle. Um, Chase would also play some special teams, kickoffs and punts, and occasionally play a little bit of wide receiver on offense. And uh, this day, um, well, let me just tell you this. Uh, Chase was um, 5'10", 150 pounds <laughs> on a good day, so not very big for a football player, but what he lacked in size, he made up for with tenacity and hustle and just a strong desire to win. And this day was no different. Uh, he was uh, making plays all over the, all over the field, uh, making tackles, breaking up passes, playing on special teams well, and um, – uh, it was a hard-fought game. The lead had gone back and forth several times. We came down to the end of the game, one minute left to play. 
we were behind by a touchdown, behind by seven points, and we had the ball inside of our own five yard line. So we had 95 yards to go to score, to score a touchdown. And um, it's fourth down and long. I mean, we needed a huge play right now, or our opponents would get the ball back, more than likely run out the clock, and we go home with a loss. Well, Chase had not played one down of offense all day. All of a sudden, I see him running from the sideline into the offensive huddle. I moved up to the edge of my seat because I knew what was about to happen. I knew what kind of a player he was. I knew what kind of a person he was. And I'd seen this before. So I'm getting ready. And, um, uh, you know, the huddle breaks. Chase lines up in the slot as a wide receiver. Our quarterback takes a snap from the shotgun formation, drops back a few steps, and Chase used his speed to beat the defensive back steep and our quarterback through chase. Um, what ended up being about a 60 yard pass, perfect spiral, came in over his right shoulder and chase reached out his hands, grabbed that pass, tucked it away, took a few more steps before he was brought down from behind. He gave us a um, first down, put us deep in our opponent's territory. Two plays later, we scored the touchdown that would tie that game up. Um, and we ended up winning the game in triple overtime. So uh, it was an exciting finish. I went down to the activity bus where Chase and his teammates, well, actually Chase hadn't arrived yet, but his teammates and his, um, his coaches were all gathered there outside the activity bus. And uh, I started, you know, talking to them. We were all uh, just kind of enjoying the victory and, and, and just, you know, celebrating. And I see Chase coming to me in the distance has a um, big grin on his face and, I gave him a hug, told him how proud I was of him, and uh, congratulated him on the victory and the big catch and everything. And they all made their way eventually back onto that bus and went back to the school that they had come from. So uh, Chase was at a military school. And um, this, you know, he had transferred there middle of his junior year because he had been experiencing um, some issues. Um, it really just kind of hit me out of the blue in about the middle of his sophomore year that um, I realized his grades were slipping. Um, he was becoming sort of rebellious a little bit at home. And I caught him in some lies and he had never um, lied to me really before. I mean, I'm, everybody tells a few little lies when they're growing up, right? But he would, even when he knew he was going to get in trouble, he would tell me the truth. He had just, you know, he, he was just uh, really truthful like that. And so it was out of character for him. Um, so I saw a lot of other warning signs and I had, I had um, uh, encouraged him to transfer to this military school. And um, um, anyway, back to the story, he, um, you know, he went back to the school. I came back home here after the game. I came back home here to our house in Cary. And uh, the next day I had a phone call from Chase's head coach. And he said, Mr. Rogers, uh, that was an amazing game Chase had. Uh, he gave me everything he had all, out there all day long. And then at the end of the game, when we needed him the most, he came in and made that big catch to put us in a position to be able to win the game. But there's one more thing I need to tell you. He said, uh, Chase broke his foot in the first quarter of the game and didn't tell anybody. He played the entire game on a broken foot. And that's just the type of um, football player he was, type of person he was. He was a performer when he was on the field. He was very quiet and easygoing, had kind of a weird sense of humor, a little bit funny, you know. But but um, when he was on the football field, he was a strong competitor, and he was going to give, give it everything he had every time he was out there. So – you know, he just he just didn't want to come out of the game. He he didn't know his foot was broken. I don't think he just knew it hurt really bad, and he just kept his mouth shut and and finished out the game. So he was out the rest of the season uh, on crutches. But despite that, he only played six games his his senior year because of that. But uh, he still made first team All Conference, honorable mention, All State. And there were a few college football scouts who showed some interest in him. On the D2 level, Division II level, he wasn't big enough to be a Division I uh, prospect. But um, there was a college uh, out of state uh, that offered him some scholarship money to come there and play football and, and go to school there. And so he took them up on that offer and headed off to college. And it was um, very early on, he began to hang out with people who were abusing drugs and alcohol. 
And pretty soon, you know, he was abusing drugs and alcohol. And um, it was uh, really the second semester of his freshman year. He early on in the second semester, he dropped out, came back home, immediately gravitated to an even rougher crowd at home. And um, he would, he was, he was really not trying to look for any work. I had encouraged him to get work. I told him, look, if you want to go to uh, uh, technical college, I'll pay for that. If you want to go to, to techno, technical college and pick up a trade, learn a trade, or, you know, there's always a military, there's, you know, I can help you. What, what do you want to do? But he just wasn't motivated to do anything. And uh, he was not, um, well, he would be gone for days at a time. He would be gone sometimes for days at a time, and he wouldn't communicate with us. We'd try to call, try to text. He would just ignore us. And that was the one rule my wife had was, look, if you're going to be gone, if you're living with us, you're an adult, and you're not doing anything productive right now, the one rule I have is that um, the, the one main rule is that, you know, if you're going to be gone overnight, you have to communicate with us and let us know you know, where you are, um, or some idea where you are, and, and when we can expect you back, and he wouldn't do that, and so uh, one day he was gone like three days, and did not communicate, would not respond to any text or attempts to call him, and so he came to the door, and a friend was waiting out at the curb, you know, they, they were in their car, and they had dropped him off, and he came to the front door, and I was home, and I wouldn't let him in, I was the only one here. I wouldn't let him in. And, and just, you know, I felt like to let him in at that point would be to continue to enable his self-destructive behavior. So uh, it was really one of the hardest things I've ever done. And, um, you know, it really, it broke my heart to watch him get in that car with his friends. I use that word loosely and ride away, not knowing if I would ever see him again or not. And I uh, kept up with him on social media. He was losing weight rapidly. He uh, was pale, you know, I, I'm looking at his photos on social media, pale, glassy eyed. And I would see pictures, sometimes that he would post where it looked like he was holed up in hotel room with friends and they're all strung out on drugs. That's the way it looked to me. So, you know, I became very alarmed that as a parent that I was going to lose Chase. Either he was going to die, he was going to, um, you know, go to jail, something was, he was headed in a really bad direction fast. And I was just searching my mind, like, what can I do to get this kid back on track and, and help him out? And um, the word intervention popped into my head. I had never watched the show, watched a whole episode, just surfing channels. I had seen the show intervention. I got the gist of what it was about. And so I began to uh, search Google for interventions. And I found a company in Chicago. I hired them. They sent someone to our house to do an intervention for Chase. And through that intervention, we were able to get him into treatment in South Florida. He spent 30 days in treatment. He went from there into a halfway house, bounced around to several different halfway houses, and spent a total of about nine months in Florida. And um, he Came back home. When he got back home, he was doing a lot better. Uh, he was staying away from the people who had been a bad influence before. He was uh, going to IOP, intensive outpatient care, kind of like group therapy, two nights a week. He got a job. Uh, it was a it was a retail job working in a pet store, but you know um, it was a good start. And he liked his work. He liked the animals. He knew a lot about the animals. He was good with the customers. Uh, his coworkers, his boss liked him. He was doing great with that. And we felt like, and when I say we, his family, myself, all the other family members, and um, all of Chase's really good friends, we felt like we had the old Chase back. But as the months went on, I detected that something wasn't right. Well, I didn't know anything about addiction at the time. I'd never experienced any addiction in my family, really knew nothing about it. And I, but I knew something was up, something was wrong, something was off. And he was relapsing is what was happening. And he finally came to me one day and he said, dad, you know, I'm headed in a bad direction again. Uh, I said, I know. And uh, he said, uh, I don't know what to do about it. I know I need to get away from these people who are a bad influence on me, but I don't really know how to do it except to move. 
So he told me I've taken a job transfer to Florida back to the area where I was in treatment. And he said, um, he told me when he planned to leave. And I told my wife, Kim, and Kim made Chase promise that he would come by and have a meal with us before leaving for Florida. Um, the day came that he was supposed to come by and eat with us and he didn't show up. Again, tried to call, tried to text, no response. And I was getting later in the afternoon and we moved to the living room, Kim and I and our youngest son, Justin, he was in the eighth grade at the time. We're sitting in the living room and we're just kind of hanging out, watching a little TV, surfing our phones, talking. And I had a phone call from one of my friends. So I didn't want to, I didn't want to disturb Kim and Justin with my phone conversation. So I took it outside. It was a nice day out, May the, May the 29th, 2014. So I'm standing out in my front lawn talking with my friend when a city of Raleigh police cruiser pulled up to the curb in front of our house. I was a little bit uh, surprised that it was city of Raleigh because for whatever reason over the years, and I don't see them do this anymore, but for the longest time, the town of Cary where I live, uh, they, uh, I would see the police officers stop right there and do paperwork right on the curb, right kind of where my driveway is. And there's, there's a, um, there's another street that dead ends almost right into our driveways. Anyway, they would sit there and I, I'd see them doing their paperwork. But this was a city of Raleigh uh, police car. And I said, hmm, something's weird about that. So um, I told my friend, I need to go. Apparently Chase is in some kind of trouble because I could see by now the officer's out of his vehicle. He started up our driveway and he has a clipboard in his hand, I noticed. So I hung up with my friend. I go to meet this officer in our driveway, and that's where he told me, Mr. Rogers has been a bad wreck out on I-40, and your son Chase died at the scene. Right where, um, right almost in that exact same spot where I was standing, I can't tell you how many times I threw Chase passes with the football, you know, and I would throw him just out of reach just to watch him use his athleticism to try to make diving catches, you know, kick the soccer ball around and and right there in the front yard and, um, you know, played some baseball, you know, and throwing the baseball around. And um, over the years, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time with him um, camping. He was, he was an Eagle Scout. Both of my boys are Eagle Scouts and uh, he was an Eagle Scout. We, um, we camped, hiked, fished, hunted. I mean, you name it, we were outdoorsmen. We, we loved the outdoors. So um, now here's this officer standing here in my driveway telling me that Chase is dead. And there's a long, awkward pause um, as I'm trying to wrap my head around this. And finally, I looked at this officer and I said, I asked him, he's, he's dead? And I thought maybe, you know, my mind was doing these playing these little tricks on me, like I misunderstood what he said or whatever, you know, he's hurt or he's in the hospital or anyway, he said, yes, sir. He kind of dropped his head. And he asked me, Ken, uh, is there someone inside you'd like me to notify? I said, well, that's my job. Let me do that. And I, and I wasn't looking forward to it, but I did feel like it was my responsibility to do that. And um, he asked me if he could go in with me for support, and I agreed to that. And so we go in through the front door. I go in first, and he's coming in behind me. And I look to my right. My, my wife, Kim, is sitting in the recliner, make eye contact with her. And back in the corner, our son, other son, Justin's on the sofa. And um, a split second later, as the officer comes in the door behind me, I see the expression on Kim's face change to one of terror because she knows whatever I'm about to say is not going to be good. And I just had to come out and tell her, honey, there's been a bad wreck and, and Chase is dead. And of course, we all cried for a long time. It took a while to get settled down. And once we did, um, uh, we all began to ask the officer questions about what had happened. He didn't have a lot of answers that day, but um, as time went on, we began to get some answers, a few answers. And uh, one of the things that we heard in, in the beginning was that there was a rumor. There was this rumor that we heard that uh, Chase and some of his friends had, uh, there was a big going away party the night before and Chase and some of his friends had had been there and consumed a lot of drugs and alcohol and, and they woke up late the next morning, they felt hung over and they said, hey, let's go to the park. There's a park very close to our home that they went to. Let's go to this park and let's smoke some marijuana. It'll help with help us cope with our nausea. 
So they they did go to the, this part's in the police report. They did go to the park. They did smoke marijuana together in the park. And Chase, he was the only one that had a car. It was actually my dad's car. He was a Southern Baptist preacher. And um, my mother left a handwritten note that Chase was to get the car. So um, uh, anyway, it was Chase's car, but then they all smoked together and he let this girl, and he, it was a girl, really attractive girl that he had dated at one time. He let her, she was 18, he let her get behind the wheel of his car. He got in the front passenger seat and another kid got in the back seat and they, um, they left the park. They made one quick stop to grab a bite to eat. And then they got out on I-40, headed eastbound, right in rush hour traffic. They only went about two miles before she lost control of Chase's car in a curb. Car spun out of control, left the road, struck a tree, impacted on the uh, driver's side rear door. And it the impact left that door looking like a U. I mean, literally just like in the shape of a U. And uh, when it when it hit, the car rolled up on its side and the tree came right across where Chase was sitting. And then the centrifugal force carried the car on around to the back side of the tree. When you when I first looked at the photos of the of the wreck, I thought, how did that car get there? You know, and it took a little while to, to figure it out. But uh, it was such a weird uh, position that it ended up in. Um, and um, it took firefighters. Uh, emergency personnel, almost an hour to get the three of them out of the car. They had to inflate airbags underneath the car to lift it up, get it up off the ground, and then they had to cut the roof off to get them out. And um, they, um, the kid that was in the back seat was the back glass was broken out, and he was hanging out. The back glass, his, his legs were caught up in the car and crushed. Um, and uh, anyway, they got them out. They transported the two survivors to the hospital right away with serious injuries. Um, and over the next several weeks, they would recover from their injuries to the extent that they could return home and continue their recovery there. But then seven months after the wreck and just a few weeks Prior to what would have been her first court appearance, the girl that was driving Chase's car that day died after a fire broke out in her apartment. The fire chief said that based on uh, his department's investigation, he believes that she poured gasoline all over the floor of the apartment, stood in the middle of it, and ignited it. There were two suicide notes that were found. So um, that's the story in a nutshell. Um, this, um, like I said, uh, 2014, immediately after the wreck, pardon me for just a minute, my throat's getting a little bit dry, so I'm going to get just a drink of water real quick. Um, immediately after the wreck and after, after Chase died, uh, I, I wasn't really, I was grieving. <laughs> But um, I, I wasn't I, I wasn't experiencing any anger issues or anything like that. But I, I don't know exactly when it was. Maybe three weeks into it, I started to get really angry because, um, for one thing, I realized that the driver was going to walk away with little or no punishment whatsoever under the law for the role that she played in Chase's life and in Chase's death. Now, one thing I did, uh, you know, in hindsight now, I can look back and go, well, you know, Chase bore probably the lion's share of the responsibility because he was the oldest, it was his car, you know, and he let her drive. He knew she she didn't even have a driver's license and he knew that and he still let her get behind the wheel of his car. So, yeah, I was angry and I was really angry at the people that I felt like were a bad influence on Chase because we didn't raise him like that, you know, um, and um it just, uh, you know, I, I, anyway, so I've got over, I'm over the anger now, <laughs> the anger part of it, but it took me a while. <laughs> so uh, I wrote a book in 2015 titled A Life Half Lived, and uh, I made it free for people to download on Amazon. Um, and it just, I don't know how many 
downloads that book has had now, but I've had people that have read that book in, that's how I met my friends in Ireland. They came here to visit us because their son um, died from a heroin overdose in his early thirties. And uh, it, um, she read my book and it resonated with her, even though it was a different drug, you know, and uh, they, stayed here with us for three days. It's like amazing, you know, <laughs> like I've got these new friends that are living in Ireland that uh, they're just an amazing couple. Uh, anyway, just because I wrote this this book, but I look back on the book now and I go, man, I sure was angry. And, and you know, for whatever reason, the book has resonated with people. I guess I was very raw and, and uh, they, they just, people resonate. It resonates with people. And even people who are I get some reactions from people who are, you know, who are addicted or maybe in recovery, but most of them, even them, they reach out and say, and, and they give me good reviews and say, wow, you know, this book really hit home with me. So uh, that was kind of the, the, you know, that was the, that was my way of healing. It took me about a year to write that book. And I sat here writing it, you know, right where I'm sitting right now with my computer uh, with just tears streaming down my face um, every night. And um, anyway, so after the book, um, I did start doing some some volunteer work. Um, I did hook up with North Carolina Mothers Against Drunk Driving. And uh, then I did hook, connect with, with Aubrey and um, uh, Parents Posed to Pot, um, Mom Strong, you know, all those groups. And um, so continued doing some work there. And um, eventually, I mean, I started in 2016 doing uh, drug prevention speaking. And, and I see Catherine there. She was really instrumental <laughs> in helping me get started with the, with, the, uh, with the speaking. I had done, you know, a few talks before that, but... Um, but uh, ended up going up to Vermont and, and traveling all around the state uh, over about, I think it was about a nine day period. The first time I went up there and spoke in schools and uh, just a lot of different venues there. Um, and that was great for, for getting me broken in, you know, for the prevention speaking. And um, I moved on to speaking, you know, doing a lot of speaking in churches and schools and just a lot of different organizations around. I've, I've done a lot for uh, MAD. Um, they, uh, MAD has, uh, two different programs that I've been a part of. Part of it is, um, one they call Power of Youth. I haven't done that lately, but Power of Youth, um, you know, MAD's more focused on the alcohol because that's how they started, but they, in terms of impaired driving, but they also do other types of education. And North Carolina MAD has allowed me to bring in some education about marijuana when I, when I've done that type of speaking. And the last year or so, I have not, been part of the Power of Youth program, but I've been speaking to what they, what they call VIPs, Victims Impact Panels. And at the Victims Impact Panel, you're speaking to first-time DWI offenders. And the first few times I did that, man, that was a tough crowd. <laughs> uh, you know, they just, there was just this tension in the room because they felt like they were being judged. And I figured out, I came up with this little um, thing that I do where I bring out three pair of shoes and I talk about walking a mile in these pair of shoes and I, I tell them, you know, how, um, you know, I'm not here to judge you. You know, I haven't walked a mile in your shoes. So I don't know what your life has been like. I don't know what led you to this point. And it just lets down the barriers. And um, it's been a really good, it's been a really good experience and it, it has helped me develop as a speaker. Um, trying to think what else. Let's see. After, after that, then I, then I, uh, someone connected me. I was still looking for ways to solve these problems and, and to learn more about addiction. And um, someone direct, it was actually, actually an interventionist who uh, was Chase's interventionist who directed me towards PAL. Uh, PAL is Parents of Addicted Loved Ones. It's a peer support group for parents who have addicted children. And um I, I started out, I went to a PAL meeting and the group had just gotten started uh, a few weeks before I showed up. And the lady that was facilitating the group, she asked me if I would, uh, Christine Williams was her name, and she asked me if I would uh, become a co-facilitator just to take some of the weight off of her. And, and I did. And then it wasn't long after I got uh, approved to be a co-facilitator that she asked me 
if uh, she said, I've, I've got to go back to work full time, and she was just working part time, and she said, I really don't have time to do this anymore. So, so I took over as facilitator of the group, and uh, I've been facilitating it ever since. And when COVID hit, we went online, and we're still online right now, although most power groups do not meet online or in person, they've gone back to in person meetings. But uh, anyway, uh, PAL has been a really good learning experience for me. Um, a lot of uh, really great parents in the group. Um, you know, we, have, we have a core group that's really solid. And, um, you know, I've had a couple of co-facilitators. And uh, it's, just a, it's just a great way for parents to, number one, figure out, you know what, I'm not in this alone. There are other people going through the same thing. And they learn from each other. Um, and they get a lot of, there's a lot of valuable information. I lean on my PAL group parents, you know, when I need information for certain things, particularly when it comes to what are some of the best treatment options out there? Who are the best therapists in our area? Who, you know, they have all the answers on that. I mean, I can go to um, a dozen different ones and, you know, I'm, I'm compiling a list of treatment options from, from everybody, you know, from all the information I've gotten from these parents. So, um, anyway, that's that's pretty much uh, my journey in, in Chase's story. And um, I, I think I've told you just about everything I can think of um, uh, concerning that. So I guess we can open it up if you have any questions. Oh, there was one more thing just to wrap it up. I am a, um, I am a family recovery coach now, which means that I coach parents who have a child who has a substance use disorder. So um, uh, sometimes I work with just the parents. Sometimes I work with the parents and the child. Um, that's the way I would prefer it would be. Um, but it depends on where people are in the journey. You know, um, not every um, child. And when I say child, uh, I mean, uh, it could be an adult child, you know, any age, really. But um, uh it just depends on where they are in their journey. If they're open to um, talking to someone like me, then then yeah, you know I can work with with them too. But if uh, otherwise, then you know it's just working with the parents. So um, anyway, um, I'm I'm ready for some questions. Uh, I guess whenever whenever you guys are ready. Well, thank you so very much, Daryl. We appreciate you sharing your son with us and your story with us to give us uh, courage and hope. Um, I have two questions before we open it up to okay. uh, the, um, the attendees. Where can they find a PALS meeting? Like, where do they go? They can go to palgroup.org. That's P-A-L group.org. Palgroup.org. And um, you, can, you can look right there on the website. There's a list of meetings in different areas. And they have a national online meeting if you can't find, if you don't have a meeting in your area, or you can start a meeting in your area, get the information from them that, that you need to start the meeting. Um, uh, or there are a few regional online meetings out there. And, and if somebody wanted to contact you to get more information about your family um, peer coaching service, or even just to ask you questions and connect with you, how would they get a hold of you? They can email me. D Rogers and Rogers has a D in it. D R O D G E R S 61 at hotmail.com. They can, they can reach me that way. Um, I have a couple of different websites. I have um, Daryl Rogers.com. D A R R Y L R O D G E R S.com or um, V family recovery coach.com. So uh, those are different ways they can, can reach me. Okay. Um, does anybody want to ask a question? Hi, this is Cynthia. And I guess I have a question regarding your, your younger son and how's, how's he doing with, you know, everything that materialized and has happened. That's a great question. Thank you, Sandy, for that. Um, man, we are so, so, so proud of him. He is, um, hmm, might get choked up talking about it. He is doing so great. He um, he um, wanted to be a football player, just like his big brother. And uh, he was a really good football player in high school. Really, really good. And 
he, again, not a real big kid, but he ended up going to a Division II school in South Carolina. They offered him an opportunity to play, and he um, he graduated just past December. Uh, it's, it was a small um, uh, private school. He graduated and um, graduated with a chemistry degree, and he is he has been accepted into five different chemistry PhD programs, and he's just waiting to see if any of the other schools that he applied to offer him anything, and he's going to some visits right now, and um, he's got it narrowed down right now, I think, to two or three, so um, uh, we're really excited about that. Um, he is um, he's taken it up in interest recently in aviation. I have an aviation background, and so um, a couple of times, you know, he's using Microsoft Flight Simulator, and it's really good now. It's impressive what you can do with it. And uh, he's called me in there and said, hey, Dad, can you can you uh, do the radio communications for me on take off over here and fly to this airport and blah, blah, blah. So it's kind of a it's really um, it's really neat. You know, we, we've uh, we've really grown close um, uh, for a little while there after Chase died. You know, um, he he was they just have, you know, I think most parents would tell you that they have two children, two, especially two boys or two girls that, um, their personalities are so different. And, and he and Chase were just like that. Um, uh, he could be very stubborn <laughs> and I figured out it took, you know, I had to learn the hard way, but I figured out that, um, I could not, uh, I could not tell him what to do. He was not, that was not going to work. And um, as soon as I backed off and began allowing him to um, make his own decisions, make his own mistakes, it totally flipped so that when he was in college, he would call me and say, Hey dad, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And, you know, um, I got this girl problem. <laughs> and it was very flattering to me that he, th he thought I had all the answers, you know, to all these problems, but uh uh, anyway, we have a we have a really really close relationship now, and, and he's doing great. Thanks for asking. He he um he ha he hangs out with he surrounds himself with good people. We're um he's done really well about about picking good friends and separating himself from the people he needs to. Uh, I really um I'm very sorry for your for for that you had to go through this and for losing your son. Um, it's it. It was very, it was really hard to listen to and to hear it. Um, you mentioned a few things that just hit home with me. My 18 year old, you know, you, you talked about losing weight. Your son was losing weight. Um, uh, my son Ashin smokes uh, marijuana every day. He vapes. I hear him coughing and vaping and coughing and vaping. It's almost like his body is so angry with him that he just coughs to the point of even throwing up. Uh, you also mentioned the 29th of May. That's my parents' uh, uh, wedding anniversary. And you also mentioned oh, wow. Ireland, and I'm from Ireland. So just a few little things. <laughs> it's, it's my higher power telling me I was supposed to be on here tonight. That's that's for sure. And I thank you for being here and sharing that story. Um, I definitely will be calling you because uh, I'm trying everything, obviously, to get my son back on track. Um, and I'll keep trying. Um, so, you know, he just cannot get, you know, he's, he can't get motivated. He's supposed to be uh, graduating this, uh, this year. And I'm not even sure that that'll happen. You know, he's very much in denial about it too, you know? Oh yeah. So, and I just, yeah, you know, when you're talking about, that's how it starts, you know, I can say he hasn't done that yet and he hasn't done heroin yet and he hasn't. You know, but they're just like around the corner, you know. Mm -hmm. And you know, the marijuana these days, uh, you can be laced with fentanyl. I mean, it's it's bad enough by itself, you yeah. know. Um, but it's just, uh, yeah, it is just. Uh, things have gotten worse in terms of the drug crisis, you know, since since I've been doing this, um, or since Chase died. Um, I first learned about fentanyl in probably 2015. Yeah, about 2015. 
um, because I, I really, I, I, I got in touch with some of the kids that knew Chase and some of them were drug dealers. Some of them were drug users. And I was wow. trying to educate myself on what was going on. And uh, I, I got to know these kids pretty good. And um, one of them called me one night. My buddy is in the woods behind this uh, house uh, development. And he's uh, he keeps calling me and he keeps passing out. I said, what's wrong with him? He's, um, he's He used fentanyl. Wow. And uh, that kid ended up going to somebody else found him before we did. I was out there looking for him, but he ended up going to the ER and he survived, you know, but, uh, but man, it's just, that was the first time I'd ever heard about fentanyl there. And well, you know, a hundred, over a hundred thousand people died from uh, fentanyl overdoses last year, but, um, but yeah, the THC, um, you know, the, the potency has increased so much um, since the, well, really since about the mid nineties. Um, and it's just, it's just so strong. So it's just um, a lot different than what it, what it used to be. Um, I'm working with a mother and a 17 year old right now. And he is, uh, and it's marijuana. And it seems like most of the parents that uh, get in touch with me now, it's marijuana is the issue. Um, and he, um, I just started with them, but but uh, what I'm doing is is getting I'm sort of mentoring him and getting him interested in his future because he had no plan for his future, and I can see the lights coming on like he's getting excited. And he, I told him one of his homework for last week was to make a, make an appointment at the local technical college and, um, uh, you know, go over there for like a career exploration day. And he put he's made the appointment so. <laughs> Anyway, it's, I'm really proud he's moving in, in the right direction. And um, anyway, it, it's, you know, um, I just, I like working with the kids when I get a chance to, I connect well with them. And, um, and I really, um, I, I know what parents are going through because I've been through it. Yeah, well, that's, that's great. It's nice to hear that, that some kids are actually responding well to the, the help. Um, so yeah, I'll definitely be calling you. Okay. So that you know, maybe to set up something where you could talk to him or talk to the him and me together. Okay. Um, yeah. That would be that'd be awesome. Yeah. Be happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aubrey, Thanks. for setting this up also. Oh, Thanks for so, the question. So welcome. And, and we thank you for all you do. Uh, Kathy Kathleen gives a lot of support to a lot of families um through our uh, Marinon groups too. So we we thank her too. So it's all, it takes a community. So um, we wish you the best. And I know what Daryl was saying earlier that, you know, the marijuana is so much more potent than THC products. And I think, I think I met Daryl, I think I met you way back in 2015. I can't remember what year it was, but boy, even back then it was such a problem. Mm -hmm. But man, it's just gotten a thousand times worse. It's it's devastating. And um, so we and need, go ahead. It, I'm sorry. They keep, they continue to push the, with the legalization efforts, you know. Um, uh, right now, there's an effort in my state to um, legalize um, a quote unquote medical marijuana. <laughs> um, and everybody that knows anything about what's going on knows that's just a foot in the door. That's just, that's always been their modus operandi to, uh, it's incrementalism, right? First they, first it's medical marijuana. Well, who's going to argue with that? Because it's medicine, right? And, uh, and uh, not really, but, <laughs> but people tend to believe that. Well, I mean, if, if somebody's getting some kind of uh, uh, relief out of it, then why would I want to take that away from them, you know, or some kind of benefits? So that's an easy sell for them, but then it just, okay, well, now we got medical marijuana, just one step further, you know, and it's always just one, we just need to add one more thing, just one more, just one more. And the next thing you know, you have full legalization and um, they always tell all the lies about legalization. Like, oh no, you're, you're, um, you know, this will never happen. That'll never happen. The kids won't get it and all that. The kids won't have access to it. And it's just, you know, we all know how it always turns out. Um, I just needed to thank you, Daryl, um, your story, very sad, but beautifully told. 
and um, you're honoring your son so much. It really, really touched me. And uh, I just wanted to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, Maria. It's healing for me. Um, and it's kind of like every time I tell the story, it's kind of like ripping the wound off again. And I, sometimes I wonder why I put myself through that, but, but um, it, is, it is part of the healing process. So um, look, I'll say this. I've experienced grief on both sides. I've experienced the grief of having a child in active addiction, and I've experienced the grief of losing a child. And both types of grief are very real. You could call it anticipatory grief if you want to, or whatever term you want to use. But um, for me, the grief associated with as, as bad as the grief has been and as intense as it has been, the grief from losing Chase, I think the grief uh, involved with having a child in active addiction was even harder. Um, and I only had to deal with that for about a year and a half. You know, there are parents that I've met that are going on 10 years, 11 years, 12 years, 15 years. And I just, man, I just can't even imagine uh, that. But um, uh, I, I can tell you that for me, um, uh, you know, learning to lean into the pain and try to do something positive with it has been an opportunity for me to grow spiritually, to grow as a person. Um, I'm not the same person. I'm not the same person I was just a few years ago. And um, now, um, you know, I was not, I had no compassion or very little for people who were if you want to say drug users or addicts before, I was very judgmental um, when it comes to them. And um, even after Chase died, you know, I blamed it all on his um, people that he associated with and how they were a bad influence. And they were, you know, but, but I've learned that, you know what, everybody has problems and they're just different problems. They just have a different problem. And that's what I tell the people when I speak at the VIPs. I, you know, I know there's people in here who have a, a drinking problem or a drug problem. I know there are. And it's okay. When it's not okay to stay that way and not do anything about it. And it's not okay to get behind the wheel impaired. But, um, but you know, nobody's judging you in this room, at least tonight, for having that problem. And, um, um you know, I've learned that, you know, if you can reach out with compassion, you have a lot better opportunity to, to um, help people and to make a change. Um, so anyway, it's been, uh, there's been, it's been a process for me and I'm, I'm still growing and learning, but uh, uh, thanks. Thanks for, for, for that comment. 